I'm talking to, to Josh Pyman, who co-starred in Tiny Pretty Things on Netflix. Um, I loved it um, because Thank you. Having, having lived, I, when I first moved to London as a young journalist, my sister and I lived with a ballerina and we saw the reality, you know, that just how hard, how grueling, all the injuries, she was always having to go to this, um, to Pilates classes to put her broken body back together again. I've never forgotten it. You know, it certainly wasn't, we saw the reality that it's beautiful when you see ballet performed and the way dancers push themselves to the absolute limits of physical mm. ability to achieve something. But that takes a terrible toll on the body. How do you, how do you feel now that you've done Tiny Pretty Things about your role as Dev? You don't play a dancer, you play a whiz kid. You play a academic, intellectual, rather closed off protege. Mm. What, what do you think about your character and what drew you um, to the part? Well, um, to touch on what you said about ballet, I initially, before even um, filming Tiny Pretty Things or the, before the script came across my, my desk, I had not even seen a ballet show in my life. I had no idea about the ballet world. Never, and never seen a ballet before. No, before. never, never before. And then, so when I got to set and I saw, I got there um, about a month after they started shooting the first um, block and I saw how hard everybody was working. They were doing rehearsals every single day. They were working 16, 18 hour days and their bodies were breaking and they just had to keep going. One of um, our um, one of our leads um, tore a hip during the, the, sh the shoot. And so I just gained so much respect for ballet dancers and um, the craft that it is and it's it's so beautiful to watch it is and beautiful. some of the most breathtaking scenes in tiny pretty things are the dance sequences i i, I watched it again last i watched a lot of it again last night to, to see your character and yeah i was blown away by the dancing it's beautiful contemporary dancing it's just um to see that kind of fluidity to see what you can do with a human body leaping through the air as if it's nothing, it's, it's completely effortless. It's, it's amazing to watch. Yeah, and the world that that entails is is so brutal as well. And, and, and what, that's what we depict as in the in the series and what we're trying to convey. Does that appeal to you, the fact that yes, it's beautiful and exhilarating and extraordinary to watch, but to, to be able to achieve that, there, there's a darker story of injury, you know, that I, I recall that scene last night where Bet, um, no, not, not Bet, the um, the lead. What is her name? Nevea. The, the, the female lead in Nevea. Nevea, yes. Where Nevea, uh, her mother is absolutely horrified. She's using glue over over um, an open wound on her. Yeah, foot. yeah, I remember that scene. Yeah. It, and you know she's she. A lot of the dancers present this as if it's there's no option. They do these harmful things to their body. Mm. They're locked in that battle to be the best and, and to be chosen to dance the lead, no matter yeah. what cost to themselves. How do, how do you, you know, how do you feel about tiny pretty things now and, and the, the world of dance having uh, been, been part of it and, and working with some of the best young dancers in the world right now? Yeah, I mean, it was it was such a privilege to get to watch that up, up close and personal. Um, I can remember it, it moved me many times actually watching them perform. You know, I was sitting with the, the directors and, and the producers and watching them do the raw takes. I was actually moved many times. I can remember um, when they were filming episode seven and Nabil has his dream sequence where he does that duet with Cassie and they're all dressed in white and um, they're in the dance studio. Do you know that, you know that scene? Yeah. yeah. And we were watching this unfold and we were hearing the music and we were watching it on the monitors and 
you know, it was so beautiful and elegant and um, graceful. And, you know, Michael. You really um, get lost in the storytelling, the story. Well, yeah. And the dark. And once that was, once they called cut and the lights went back on, everybody was, had tears in their eyes. Everybody. We were all just so moved by it. So, so how, do yeah. you, how would you go to it? I mean, you can't go and you can watch things online, but would you go and see a ballet now? Yeah, pro absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's completely sure. changed and opened up your world to, to dance. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of kind of what I do for a job as well. It, it definitely opens my, um, my, my mind to uh, broader experiences such as ballet. And I, I probably may have never seen or known much about ballet um, if I didn't do this role. So um, that's kind of such a blessing in a way that I get to learn new things. Yeah, well, that, that, that's why we do what we do, don't we? We want to be constantly learning. When mm. we stop learning, we're, we're in trouble. So Absolutely. let's let's talk about you and um, growing up in Brisbane in, in Australia. Mm. What are your earliest recollections of watching drama and film on on television? And were you interested from the get go? I actually wasn't um, totally interested from the get go. Uh, my family, we we watched movies together occasionally. But um, I can I can remember we always used to watch Princess Bride together, and that was one of our favorite movies to watch as a family. But I didn't really get into the acting until um, I was about twelve, and I was kind of by chance cast in the school play, the the elementary, the junior school play, as the lead. When you say by chance, so you didn't push for it. No, me and my friend kind of auditioned as a joke. And, and so we went into the room and we did our, what I can't even, I can't even remember what we were required to do. We may have had to do a little scene. And then I was, I was cast as the lead. And all of a sudden I had all these lines and I'd never done anything like this before. And, you know. How, so how did you cope with that? Did it, did it excite you? It really excited me and it really excited me. And the, I don't know, there was something about being on the stage and performing and getting lost in the story. Even at such a young age, I felt, uh, I felt an exhilaration that I hadn't felt in anything else before. So, but, so basically, isn't, isn't it extraordinary how random sometimes our lives are? Something happens that becomes an extraordinary catalyst in your life and what you land up up doing, you know, it can apply to people that you randomly meet. Yeah, that absolutely. Uh, the course of your life. I find that completely fascinating. What was the role what, that you played in the, the school? It was, um, the school musical was called, um, it was called Conundrum. And I played the lead, leading man and I, I honestly, it was about princesses and princes and, um, you know, kind of your stereotypical play that you see um, young kids do. Yeah. And I, I was, I, I was so, um, I just was so lost in the whole experience and exhilarated by it. And, you know, having all the parents and the whole school come to watch those were some of my earliest memories of, of doing this thing. And that kind of planted the seed when I was young to... Did you, so did you keep going after, so after the success and, and feeling like a natural in this? I did feel like a natural, that's a good way. Yeah, I, I didn't keep going with it is the funny thing. I did drama classes as an elective, but I didn't really try, I didn't really see it as a viable career path and I somewhat suppressed my oh, that's feeling interesting. yeah that under any sort of parental or peer pressure that acting is an itinerant career well, that very few people make it I mean we know that it's like it's like being a journalist it's a really tough career yeah I can imagine you know, to it be a was 
be a writer or an actor, be an artist is always hard. Yeah, and look, that suppression of of my enjoyment of acting was probably due to the fact I went to an all boys school. Most of the graduates there, they go on to do something like be lawyers or or businessmen of some and sort. CEOs. See exactly, and was there, a lot of, was there quite a lot of academic pressure then? You know, to go into a profession. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of lots of academic pressure when you're in an environment that basically makes all their money from high achieving students and it doesn't really um, give people the opportunity to explore, you know, creative opportunities as well. Um, yeah, that's, there's definitely a kind of a mold that you feel like you have to fit to be able to fit in there. For and sure. Did you, so you went along with that for how long? Totally. I went along with that all the way up until university where I actually enrolled and studied a year in business. Oh, so and you went to business school? I did, yeah, I went to business school and, um, you know, I didn't enjoy it, but I thought it was what, you know, was necessary and, you know, it was uh, um, the path for me. But I kind of had a bit of a crisis that year and it was quite tough for me. And I realized that I was following something that wasn't meant for me. And so it was then I decided I should probably revert back to what I think I'm good at and um, give this acting thing a crack. Wow. And that must what, have been quite a, quite a decision at that point, you know, to already be in business school and have that wake up call that it wasn't the right path for you. Yeah, it, it definitely was a big kick in the guts and um and did you I, did you tell your family at that time i mean did did you leave business school then i did I, I i was talking about it to my um parents for you know a few months and i had um pretty good support from them and once i decided that this was what i was going to do i applied to an acting school in sydney didn't really have much experience and Thankfully, I was accepted and um, I studied there for two years at um, a school called Screenwise. And that's where I kind of, um, it all started for me. And I... Uh, tell really me, what, so what was that like? Where, where is Screenwise based in, in Australia? That's in Sydney. So okay. I moved from Brisbane to Sydney yeah. at that time when I was 19 um, to live on my own and... How did, um, how did you finance that? Because, you know, putting yourself through, through drama school isn't, isn't easy. I've, I've had a lot of, lot of friends who are actors. Yeah, so we had, gov had government support to pay for tuition, so we don't have to pay it back for years later. So that was, I was lucky enough to um, be able to do that and not have to worry about the cost of drama school at the moment. So all I needed to do was get a job and to support to pay the rent and pay the bills. And um, I luckily had a little bit of help as well for my parents if I needed it. So um, what that was felt it, like- What was it like? Did you immediately feel at home at ScreenWise? Yeah, I did. I did. I really did. But, you know, the first, I, I still remember the first few weeks of, you know, living, waking up in an apartment by myself. And I would wake up with just, this pressure in my chest, it was anxiety, just telling me oh, my body. Yeah, but my body just telling me like, what is going on? This is so out of your comfort zone. You, you should not be doing this, but you know, time. Well, imposter syndrome. Kind of, yeah, yeah, kind of. You know, I imagine, we, were you surrounded by people who'd been acting for a lot longer? And there must have been people who'd been acting since childhood. And you had only yeah, one it was a bit of an... at school. Were you surrounded by people who had been sort of nurtured from an early age to, to go into acting or um, into musicals or, or dance, into performing arts? It was a bit of a mixed bag in terms of there were there were some that had been doing it since childhood and then there were others that were kind of in the same boat as me and 
you know, that was kind of, um, it was nice to see that we all started on a similar playing field, which was good. And we all got to grow together as, as a unit. And, um, did, did and, you yeah. click then as, as a, as a group in this year? I mean, is, is it, what I'm interested in is, you know, how competitive the dancers are, are, they're portrayed as being very competitive in tiny, pretty things. I mean, to the point where of attempted murder and sabotage, it's, mm. it, it's very dark. Is drama school equally competitive or is it possible to make friends? Given that the stakes are so, so high, um, if you make it and become a yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it just is, isn't it? There's, there's huge pressure to succeed. Yeah. And the reality is that many people won't. Mm. I, I think there, I found it, that we, I found that we had quite um, a good and um, friendly cohort, and I don't think there was much competitiveness between us. And I think we all just kind of wanted to help each other because, you know, acting's a bit different, I guess, to dancing, uh, especially if you're using the the model of of the tiny pretty of tiny pretty things. They're all vying for the the two spots or the one spot. Whereas, you know, at an acting school, most of us leave, we get different agents, we move to different cities. We're not really in competition with each other. Yeah, unless a lot of great roles in uh, work because it's an ensemble cast. And I think that's yeah. one of the great things when you see wonderful casting come together. You know, for example, in a, in a exciting period drama, um, it, it's, it's a collective. Yeah. Um, it doesn't work without that cooperation of um, yeah a lot of many a lot of actors to bring different things to to an ensemble role. So yeah. you're right, it is important. But I mean, you know, you are always going to get people who are very competitive in in any field. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm pretty competitive. So are you? Um, ah, very competitive. Funnily enough, though. Um, you know, you, I play, whenever I play sports, I am super competitive. I hate losing, but when it comes to acting, you know, I may have been like that at the start of my, uh, my career, when I was first starting out, I was competitive with myself, but I, over time, I learned to let go of expectations and, and let go of being result oriented, orientated. And I found that once I did that, and stop comparing myself to other people. Stop comparing well, that's myself. The best. We, you know, we all do it, but it's so toxic. To, you just yeah. can't, you've got to stop comparing yourself to, to anyone else in your field. It's yeah, absolutely. And once I stopped doing that and stopped trying to be so competitive, I found myself so much freer in the work. And I found I really hit my stride once I kind of, that kind of clicked with me. It's like, well, you shouldn't really focus on getting this role or getting that part. You should just focus on getting better every day. And then the results will take care of themselves. And so that was, that really clicked for me. What, what helped you get, get to that stage? I mean, do you, do you meditate? Do you? Uh, I try or is it exercise that is a meditation for you? How do you how do you um, help yourself as an actor to, to get into the zone and, and to feel calm and to just enjoy the process? What do you do, Josh? Great question. I have experimented with many different ways um, of meditation and, and breathing exercises, but um, I think what really works for me is um just taking step taking deep breaths taking a step back and really considering how um how is how this rolls how is this going to affect me am i getting better just focusing on the now focusing on That's how am i improving always about just enjoying what you're doing right now absolutely and then get really one, good feeling, just relishing it and not worrying yeah about the deep yeah um absolutely i i read when it clicked for me was when i read um 
I, I read Brian Cranston's book, A Life in Parts. And he talks about that exact thing that I was just talking about was, you know, he was going for auditions thinking, um, why am I not getting this part? And then I remember there's a quote in the book where he says, when, when I walk into the audition room, I'm not there to get anything. I'm there to give something, to give a performance. And if you're doing that and that's your only goal, yeah. golden. So that, that that is really really good advice because that that's the thing again about writers or being an actor there there is potentially a lot of rejection and you have got to um, protect yourself from that because it's mm. not personal I mean often decisions are made so randomly that absolutely you like learn to not not take it personally and well, a lot of it is and a lot of it is out of your control. Yeah, exactly. So you, we've got to relax. We've got, got to chill chill about that. What role mm. did you play at ScreenWise that you look back on, that you really enjoyed, that helped you to do that, built your confidence, built your technique and your experience as an actor? Um, well, we didn't really do kind of um, like your traditional, you know, end of the year kind of roles or plays or things like okay. that. Um, but we what did. Was, what technique did they use then? We did cl we did um, classes there, so um, we learned different techniques, um, different methods, and um, different ways of approaching the work. And um, I think when things really started to, what the best thing I learned at Screenwise I felt was um, how to. It was the business of acting, like acting is not just you know you show up and you do the work it's also a business at the same time and so we learned a lot about that too and we did a lot of comedy classes we did a lot of improv classes um, clown work everything we, everything and um, I think it was that Did you enjoy that oh absolutely I think it was the plethora of, of things that we got to discover which was um the most fun part about it and you got to kind of pick and choose what works for you what doesn't work for you so i and feel like you're it, it, out about yourself aren't you by exploring all these different roles and oh techniques. yeah yeah absolutely you find out so much and i i always i always have thought um once uh, so i was at an award ceremony um when i was in screenwise um when i was still just about to graduate and I was volunteering as like a stagehand at an awards ceremony and I got to talking to this actor who gave me some advice and said acting is 30 percent acting 70 percent working on yourself 30 percent working on acting 70 percent working on yourself so I found that the more I've um the more I've learned about myself the better actor i am yeah I, I i can i can see that now you um you've won an award uh, a leo award for from for plantonic which is i think that's your first film short out of yep. out of drama school how did that come about josh oh um so i was just auditioning a lot I was living in Vancouver. I was so, auditioning. So you moved. So at the end of uh, your time at, at Screenwise, and how long was that? How long was the? the that was two years. Three years. Two two years. Two years. Yeah, yeah. So just slightly yeah. less than, than university. Um, yeah. Let's just talk talk uh, again uh, about the move to to Canada. So. Was that because you felt there were more opportunities in Vancouver? I know about the vibrant. Um, seen in in Vancouver particularly with a lot of a lot of um, Netflix dramas uh, are made in Vancouver because the um, the the local uh, authority has made it very easy and um, attractive to film in Vancouver they've they've um, attracted a lot of film and television companies to to bring their productions there haven't they did you uh, feel yeah, yeah. opportunities 
in Canada than back home in Australia. Is that why you made the move? That's yeah, that's, that's exactly why I made the move. Um, my did agent. Get, did you get an a, did, did you have an agent by the time you'd left Screenwise? Um, I had an agent as soon as I left Screenwise, and they we talked about move, um, moving to Vancouver and how that was an option. Yeah. And it's actually a funny, funny story. So I, um, I signed with an agency in Vancouver as well. Yeah. So I had my Australian agent and my Canadian agent. And we were talking about moving to Vancouver and, you know, it was somewhere in the distant future. And then one day I just said, I booked a ticket, I'm going. <laughs> and they're like, what? Okay, sure, go. And so I just kind of went. Did you have a place to stay? No, I just booked an Airbnb for like a month and then I was going to figure it out from there. So I, I that's scary stayed in. to just take off to Canada. Or, you know. It was exciting, more exciting than anything. You were um, excited. I was more excited, but yeah, it was definitely, you know, it was definitely yeah, lonely. Did you think, well, if it doesn't work out, I can go back? You know, how can if it doesn't work out? out I can go back and at least I know that I've given it everything that I possibly could have. And well, what, so what was the reality, you were staying in a B&B, &B. what was it, what was it like? And, and were you going to millions of castings like, every day? So, uh, the first day I got off the plane at 9am or 8am or, or something in Vancouver, and it was still dark and raining. And it was the middle of Jan middle of February. Well, and I said that, used to um, having been born and grown up in in Brisbane with a, a climate that's similar to Florida. Exactly. So you never really need a, a winter coat. It's never no really exactly. So I didn't even have a winter coat. So I, I got off the plane. I said to somebody that was walking next to me, I said, "What time does the sun come up in Vancouver?" And they said. <laughs> I don't know if the sun's coming up today. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh the, okay. I can just sure. imagine, yeah, the absolute shock right. of the different place where I've just moved to a place where there's no sun. Fantastic. And yeah, I was going to a million castings. I was going to like, I had, I think I had six or seven in the first week and that was just so consistent. And I still really didn't know what I was doing at the time. And I was just, I was just winging it and just learning. And, and was it a bit like, you know, the, the the pressing parts of La La Land? I always remember that, you know, when she's, she is going to all these castings and you're just a number and you go in and you're in there for a very short period of time. Yeah. It's, it's very impersonal. And that's where you've got to protect yourself from the, you know, the potential rejection and being on a conveyor belt until you make a leap forward mm. you know. and that was um that was very you know it, it took me a while to adjust to that reality where you know i i, I maybe I, like i definitely was a bit naive to um just up and leave but i think you have to be kind of a bit naive in order to um, you to do anything to just be brave yeah. to do it yeah it, it, i don't even think it was it, you know, it was more naivety than bravery. bravery. Well, so just, basically taking a risk. Yeah, just taking a risk. And, you know, it took me a while to adjust to that. And I did feel like I was on a conveyor belt for a while and I wasn't getting any callbacks for a long time. And so I was just thinking. How, how long is a long time? Are we talking like six months, three months, six months? I didn't book Plantonic until 18 months into being there wow yeah so which, how, did, how um how did how did you live how how did you survive in was, so I, I financially I, and, and also mentally you know to stay to stay strong so i worked in um, a restaurant and i was working there five nights a week staying up until 3 a.m. coming home at 3 a.m. and then I'd usually have a cut, uh, an audition the next morning and I was dog tired but I did that for a long time I did that for a while 
And that was how I was supporting myself. I was actually making quite good money, thankfully, at this restaurant. Okay, so you didn't have to worry about money. Yeah, so you could No, just... I didn't, not, not, not a crazy amount. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, find, I kind of just made friends and I kind of um, just involved myself in, in, in as many classes as possible. I, I, I tried to just put myself out there as much as possible in, and, you know, so, sort of create a community in this new country. Did you, did you make friends with, with other actors? Did you start to, to have a life outside of, of acting and going for auditions, you know, to, to feel at home in a new um, country and um, a new city so that you had other things other than constantly striving to get a part? Yeah, I, I, I luckily had, um, you know, two friends that had already done the move and moved and lived over there for a bit well, and then about a year from brisbane no um they oh, were okay. from, they were from sydney and they were with the same agency that i was with okay and so luckily i had them to kind of lean on in that first year and then actually um a year later after i'd already been there for a year um, my best friend alex came from who i went to screenwise with he made the move over and so that also made life a lot easier and it made it feel like a lot like home in a way what, what's the atmosphere like there must be so many aspiring actors and there are all these productions going on under no normal circumstances up to the pandemic what, what's the atmosphere like what's it like to be um an actor coming up through the ranks I, 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 are you aware that this is a, a, a city where great film and drama are being constantly made? Does it have that feeling? I, it, it, like an it has a lot. Like in Hollywood in a way, I guess. Um, yeah, there's, you, you do know that kind of the film runs the city at, at the same time. Like, you know, there are so many actors there. It's actually insane. And you always see the same guys in the same, in, in the same castings and different castings, the ones that, you know, you kind of look like you could be right for the same roles and you kind of, you know, give them a wave or you even make friends at some, at some point. And, you know, you definitely can feel that um, the industry is very prominent up there and they're very proud of it up there. And I think they do a great job of I, I, having I've gone to you know to Hollywood to LA as a journalist to do interviews um, in the film industry and what I remember is that every cafe or restaurant I went to there would be actors sitting reading a script or there would just be all these very attractive people who were clearly trying to get into the movies it was all pervading and I just thought it felt oppressive. Mm. Did, you, um, did you feel that about or about that uh, being in Vancouver or because you are an actor, that's your world. And so it feels normal. It feels, you're right. It feels totally normal. And you don't, you kind of don't, you know, you walk into a cafe and you see yeah, actors. Being surrounded kind of, by actors all trying to make it. It's kind of absurd when you think about it like you walking yeah. into a cafe and you are one of those actors that's highlighting lines in the cafe, but it's, it, it kind of inspires you at the same time. It, it, and it definitely inspired me. I felt like, you know, I, you know, I never felt like there was a doubt in my mind. That you were, uh, you weren't doing the right thing. That I wasn't doing the right thing. Exactly. Uh, at what point did you, get the, the the call back for Plantonic then was that your first break yes it was it was my first um first break it was a little short film an indie short film and I read the script and it was beautifully written um it was very poetically written and I got the call back for it redid the tape went in for a chemistry read and then eventually got the part and then we shot that out in um, Abbotsford. And then a week after that, I got um, 
a role in the CW's Arrow and I was on that for an episode and and that was kind of my first experience on a, on a big movie set. So things happened quite rapidly for me in that stage. But suddenly yeah. it changed. And it suddenly changed. It was Plantonic, then it was Arrow, and then it was Tiny Pretty Things after that. And then that was the big, the big one. And that was a real moment of um, Just relief. To go back to, to Plantonic. Um, tell me, tell me about the film. I, I've tried to watch it, but I couldn't find it uh, anywhere. I couldn't right, find yeah. it to if they um, had a I think it's Watch. I think it's um I've, I've seen a clip I've seen the clip yeah it's very dreamlike just tell totally. me, tell me um about Plantonic it, it looks very beautiful it is very beautiful it's um it's very and but also sad it is it, it's quite sad um it's a story of um you know it's a story of a a lonely artist which is me who grow, um, decides he wants to grow a partner out of um, this plant, and out of this um, out of this plant grows this man, and then basically um, you have to you know like like any relationship you have to water the plant, you have to give it sunlight, you have to give it attention, and you see this um, you see my character start to neglect the plant and eventually um you know things don't work out and i guess it's a story of of love and um acceptance and it's definitely quite um it's quite moving yeah and you you well you garnered a, a leo award for that which must have really um reinforced your confidence and the idea that you you've made the right career path so early in your career to yeah to um receive an award yeah that was how did you that, feel about that josh um i was quite proud of myself uh, for for that i did not really expect it coming and i guess you know i'm somebody who maybe doesn't give himself enough credit when credit's due i'm quite hard on myself and that that award really kind of affirmed to me that hey maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm okay at this you know um so yeah it was um it was great and very um it was yeah. such an honor to receive that i think it's important to remember how quickly you can lose it all well, that's true. Also, you can be flavor of the moment. You know, I'm thinking of someone like, you know, Reggie Jean Page, who is probably the most talked about actor in certain yeah. circles at the moment. And he is great in Bridgerton. But there is a danger that you, yeah, you're, you are just the, the, the man of the moment or the woman of the moment. And the media will descend on you. <clears throat> and it can go just as quickly as it came. So you have, exactly. to, you have to have a grip on reality, don't you? Otherwise you would go mad to have all that adulation one moment and potentially it could be snatched away. Yeah, you have to continue to work just as hard. You have to continue to work as if you it's, never got that role in the, in the first place. The, the like, entertainment world is fickle. Yeah, it's definitely. And I now I'm someone who... I feel like I have to work even harder now to um, get the next thing. And that's something that's important to me. I, and I don't think I'll ever lose that work ethic because I know exactly what you said. It's fickle. So, I mean, what I, overall tiny pretty things has been well received. There has been some criticism of the, the pretty bold and graphic um, sex, sexuality and mm. um, sex scenes in mm. my pretty things and your character um, has a couple of scenes like that that are very graphic how I do think there's increasing pressure on actors to to do that you can see it in Bridgerton as well you know there have been criticisms that 
part of Bridgerton is no better than soft porn. Um, well, I haven't seen Bridgerton, so I'm not You haven't sure. seen it, you know. Um, no. the, 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 there is a part where you think, really? Not more. You know, you actually get a bit sick of seeing these two characters um, having sex all the time. Mm -hmm. Also because they're, you know, they're also young. And the acting is great. You know, it, it's actually really, really well done. Far better than the book. And there's a lot of sex in Tiny Pretty Things. And, and there's a predatory, there's an overall predatory tone though, isn't there, between some of the students towards each other. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Beth's character. She's, uh, I mean, I'd say, you know, she's obviously, she's under a lot of parental pressure to be number one and she pushes herself to the limits, but she's shown as quite a predatory character with her, with her boyfriend at the time. And there, you know, there's this sort of pervading dark tone to, to tiny pretty things. And I wondered how you felt about that. I mean, presumably you've watched it all, all back now. Do you watch the, the, the programs and series that you make in detail? Some people I don't. do. Um, I have watched it all and um I've... How, do you, how do you feel how do you feel about those intimate scenes with brennan close character and your character dev they they are very very intimate mm. well i think um i think they have a uh, a story to tell and... they definitely have a story to tell uh, i and... i did like that you know the vulnerability and the the not knowing who you are you know yeah basically yeah. see you you two, yeah. two characters are, are are lost and and i would say almost alienated from yeah and i think other in the world and then you see them tentatively move in a different direction mm -hmm. and i think you know in terms of the um the sexuality of the show i think sadly we live in a day and age where young people really have no reliable source on um how to deal with sex and deal with those things that you know you have you have to eventually discover when you are you know in your teens and and, and older mm. so you know chiefly um pe young people are really you know you see online porn dominating the way that young people view sex and as we I know it there's no doubt that the availability of porn online on mobiles is permeating film and television it, it that's how where it's come from as if totally. it, as if it's the norm right well I, I think that um in terms of our young in terms of young people there's no real reliable way to um, to access information on how to deal with these things. And so I think we have online porn, as we know, is objectifying and inaccurate in every, yeah. every way possible. And so I think what we're trying to do in, in our show is to um, basically show that that's not real and what we have in the show is more accurate representation. We have people who are at completely different stages of discovering their sexuality. We've got people who are struggling with their sexual identity. We've got people who know themselves um, quite well in that way, people who don't want anything to do with sex at all. And all of that is totally... Yeah, that, that is well done. I, I love the fact that one of the female characters, June, has, has not had a sexual experience. It, yeah. That way but and she's proud of that too as, as we know in the show yes i i think it's very important to to not suggest that you know teenagers should should be doing it if they don't want to you know you don't yeah. want to be under that kind of pressure i think and i then, a much more innocent age where um we didn't have so much pressure of course everyone was talking about sex e even if it was in a more sort of surreptitious way um i think it, i think it's good that you explore through these different characters every possible complexion and shade of, of human sexuality whether you know you're going out and picking someone up randomly which ultimately 
you know, as we see, is perhaps not making Shane's character happy, and he's actually searching for love, isn't he? He's searching yeah. for the care yeah. about him. And that's yeah. great to see, to see that progression, that tentative stumbling towards something, something else in your and, and 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 that's 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 real life isn't it yeah you know, we because you just don't know who you are you know at, at 19 or 20 it's good to show that to show that you're confused and mixed up and, and lacking in confidence yeah absolutely and i mean that's that's exactly what happens in real life and that's what we've tried to do with the show and, and show every possible um avenue of how teenagers and young adults um, discover these things because these are things that we all have to discover eventually and it's it's better to see them portrayed in a more accurate way on television than to just log onto your phone and go onto a porn website so talking um, I, I, I you know absolutely agree with you um, tiny pretty things what what was the feedback that you got from your role from from your friends and also your male friends mm. about um the character you portray who who does seem to be quite inscrutable you know he how did you decide to to play him when you were when you were given the role your well the reaction from my friends was really um overwhelmingly um, supportive and everybody was just like very um very stoked for me in a way that I was you know going to be on this show and playing a role that you know has a chance to possibly impact people's lives and I think you know when I took the role the way that the characters were written you know I, I had a few scenes and the way that the scenes were written were very nuanced and the characters were nuanced and Dev, as we know, is a complex guy who- He's a complex, is, inscrutable en enigma, isn't he? Exactly, he's got a lot of weight on his shoulders. He's got a lot of expectations. He's a whiz kid and- but He's also um, young, you know, to be- So young and he doesn't, you really do. quite know where he fits in in the world right now and so um i to get an opportunity to play a character that is um really just complex and has and you know it's also an opportunity to tell a really important story and that's why i took the role and um I'm extremely grateful that I, I got to do that, for sure. It's interesting when he's faced with the moral dilemma over helping helping the students over the exploitation of mm. dancers by rich mm. devils, as they're described, which I thought was a brilliant way of portraying them, these appalling men who are using their money and power and wealth to you know, to assault young girls. And, and the reality is that that has always gone on in, mm. in the world of, of ballet, the arts, beautiful, vulnerable young, young people are always going to be prey to people in power. So how did you want to show that subtle way that he responds to that? You know, initially he's not sure, is he, whether he's going to do the right thing? And then yeah. he up at the Archer School with the document. I yeah. A really important moment, which is about him standing up for, for the kind of person he wants to be. Yeah, I think, you know, um, when we're put into situations where we have a lot of, we have a lot of responsibilities and we, especially when we answer to a boss that basically controls our life and pays the bills you know you definitely feel obligated to i think dev at the time felt that he should know, toe the line yeah that he should toe the line and i think there's that moment in the um the the club the mishi beach club where my boss is 
speaking quite derogatory. Oh, um, it's horrible. It's an awful yeah. moment. Yeah. It's, he's speaking horribly about the women that work there. And also, he's getting my name wrong. He thinks I'm an immigrant, but I was born in St. Louis. My parents were, in it, were immigrants. So basically, I think there's the moment there where he, I realize this guy doesn't care about me. Yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't belong in this. I don't belong in this in this realm. And it's also a moment where he decides, I'm going to choose shame. And um, so that's kind of how I approached that entire decision in, in the script, because, yeah, it's quite a quite a pivotal moment, for sure, for the character. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and it's, I think if we hadn't seen that progression, I would, I would have been worried. But because mm. we see the change in the character, it, it is profound. Do you think there's going to be a, a second series? Would you like to do more? I'd, I'd like love to, to do see what happens to your, to, to your character, Dev and Shane. I'd love to do, I'd love to do more. And I, I'd love to explore, you know, the relationship more i think they've both got a lot more to um to do in order to be available for each other and be that person that the other one needs and so there's so much more development left and yeah so i'd, I'd love to do another season for sure so have you heard any you know any uh, your guess is as good as mine at, at this nothing, stage nothing yet but the, the series has been well received, hasn't it? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it has been really well received. So, you know, fingers crossed. But um, so, yeah. what what what, what uh, other opportunities have come up for you, and how much is the pandemic impacting on on these opportunities right now? Uh, is is filming going on uh, in Vancouver still? I mean. Netflix is still putting out so many extraordinary new, new works. I, I'm obviously a lot of them were were wrapped before the the pandemic. They must be running out. I mean, yeah, I they, they must be. In the UK, you know, they're showing a lot of repeats on the BBC. Yeah, um, I was uh, lucky enough lucky enough to do a feature film last year during the pandemic in Australia. So that was a whole new experience. You know, we had um, a test each week and then we had masks mandatory at all times, unless you were shooting. And, you know, it was, it was, it was challenging because I was used, you know, I'm always used to being on a set and having fun with the cast mates and getting to know everybody and hanging out, but we couldn't get to, you know, sit, uh, you know, 1.5 meters away from each other, and there were just so many protocols. So that yeah. was challenging, but I that felt so um, grateful to even work of in, course. during the pandemic. And so, so, yeah. so what, what's this? Uh, what is this um, film called? Uh, it's a romantic comedy called The Dog Days of Christmas, and um, we shot that in Australia. And I'm I'm not sure when that comes out, but we should hear something eventually. Tell me about tell me about your the character you play. Um, so I play a, a supporting character, and my character is a uh, a vegan stoner who runs a food truck, and <laughs> um, and um, you know the whole plot of the of the movie is uh, this the lead late, uh, the lead character she has all these dogs to sell. Basically, I'm I'm one of the prospective buyers, but you know, my character's really sloppy. He can't fill out paperwork and he's, you know, always in his, um, in his food van and he's always smoking. And so that was a really fun. Permanently um, on a trip. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you, you'd think so from the way it portrayed. It was, it was a lot of fun to play. Is it set in the present day or is it set in the, in the past? Is it it's set in present day, um, in uh, like a, um, a hippie it's uh he does sound like yeah he is a bit of a hippie but it's um it's based in uh new hampshire kind of area of um of america so quite cold and um and so 
yeah, that was such a fun character to play. I, it's so it, it's supposed to be in America, in New Hampshire, but you filmed in Australia. Correct, yeah. Did you film it in Australia? Gold Coast, which is the okay. least area like New Hampshire you could think of, but we made it work and- you Pulled it off. Yeah, we pulled it off, for sure. And um, so, uh, uh, how is the how is the pandemic impacting on on more opportunities? Because obviously you you you've had a fairly major role in Tiny Pretty Things. The reception has been great. You would you would be expecting to go up for a lot of things now. How how is that impacting on your opportunities, Josh? I've had some pretty incredible opportunities um, arise post tiny pretty things unfortunately i can't talk about them right now but none of them, none of them. <laughs> no none of them no but um films or drama or uh the- um television television, television. so I, I would say oh and, and a few films but i would say that it's really kind of unlocked uh, a new door for me and especially in my confidence as an actor, I feel like I, I, I am good enough to book anything. And um, it really helped my confidence, the, the whole tiny pretty things. And yeah, it, it's definitely opened more doors for me, but obviously it's been a bit tough um, being in Australia and having the pandemic and traveling, travel restrictions and whatnot. So that's been a big- I know you're, um you care about mental health. Um, and I think it's so important that we, we have good open conversations uh, about it. In fact, you might be interested that an amazing woman, uh, their PR company contacted me. She, I think she's originally from New Zealand, but her name is Kim Palmer. And she's created the most amazing app called Clementine. Have you heard about it? It's basically a mental health and well-being app. No, I haven't heard of it. I was actually thinking about something like that the other day, but it looks like it's someone being killed. It's brilliant because it's just got all these courses and sessions and you can just take yourself away in a moment and listen to something to boost your confidence, to help you calm down, to just transport you to another place. They've got morning oh. sessions. It, and it's really fun. You know, there's one that's called uh, F-U-C-K it, basically, which is a brilliant way to start the morning. And another one is I've got this S-H-I-T. Um, it's <laughs> exhilarating. I just, I, I, it, it, it's basically tapped into a real need for, it's basically hypnotherapy on demand for an affordable amount of money every month. It's like eight pounds 99. And- oh, okay. You, you've got hypnotherapy on demand 24 seven, morning, noon and night. It's such a brilliant idea. You have to have to check it out. But how, mm-hmm. how have you looked after your mental health and how do you as, as a, an actor and a, a man cope with your mental health? The way we live you know, with just such a crazy fast paced world with too much time on screen all the devices we're supposed to use they don't make us feel calm i definitely long for a time when we didn't have all this connectivity i really i think that we're constantly being overstimulated what do you think i agree and um i think that you know there's all 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 sorts of studies that show um uh, about that show how um negative dopamine um dopamine hits can be to the human brain and um you know we have dopamine hits every day on instagram facebook everything um which is you know it's concerning because it's just increasing but i look after my mental health in a lot of ways i see a therapist i um journal i make sure that you say you see a therapist what do you see as a therapist for um just anything in it well-being is this like an M- a, a mental health mot what just anything and everything like uh, you know uh, i have dealt with you know bouts of um anxiety and and at times depression in my life and i um feel like the best course of action is to 
always be proactive basically be proactive and talk about it you know you, about it that's that's yeah. really good to hear josh it's, i had this with ptsd as a result of trauma yeah so, right you know i know all about that which is why i use clementine mm -hmm. and, um, i use headspace too use what headspace oh headspace i haven't tried headspace i um what what is that like how does that work is it again just, listening um, to sessions that transport you it, it, it's exactly exactly that you, it's um daily meditation practices there's all sorts of courses um you know you could do a course on anxiety you could do a course on positivity you could do a course on kindness you can do a course on um focus there's um nba themed um meditations for athletes it, it's it's great so i use that um, as much as i can and I also, um, I find that journaling is always a great way to um, just check in with yourself every day. And I, do you mean you keep a diary? I do, yeah, I keep a diary, yeah. Have you, have you always kept a diary? I've kept a diary since 2016. Right, what, so, made, what made you start? I think I read it in a book somewhere. Um, the like I read it in a book somewhere saying the the benefits of keeping a diary and so I just was like well because yeah. basically you can be totally totally open with yourself can't you? you're having a conversation with yourself and yeah. you're writing in the moment about how mm -hmm. you feel I mean I I I love being a writer I love being a writer and and a journalist and I am absolutely at my happiest when I'm doing my job, either mm. writing a, a you know a, a, an interview up with someone I I've interviewed and really getting into that, or writing about a drama or film, mm. uh, because it's so creative, and I, I imagine you probably feel the same. Yeah, you're preparing for a part, or you're in the zone actually doing that. Yeah, it's what we do, and so we feel at home doing it. It's the bits in between that I. Uh, sometimes struggle with is that, bit, is that what you find yeah. well you know just life and all the other yeah. things that we no. have to do in order to do what we really love 100 percent and or writing or broadcasting I, I, yeah 100 percent. and i feel like the more i take the time out to do those things to check in with my my myself and better myself I find that the more fun I'm having when I'm doing my job. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's, it's, what about your your friend, your other male friends and peers? Are they as in tune with themselves as you've you've nurtured and taught yourself to be? You know, to be aware of how you feel and to take care of yourself. How however you're feeling. Do you think do you think men talk enough about their feelings? and their mental well-being or is there much work to be done and, and for people to speak out about it like like you and i are but it, it's mm. fun to talk about your mental health in this country you know prince william has talked about how he was affected by his mum's death mm. and, prince I, 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 and I, yeah. I think that did a lot of good because there's been a big taboo about saying well actually i don't feel good today mm. Or I struggle sometimes. It's like you you were not allowed to say that that no. you had to pretend when you felt terrible that you were okay. And the reality is that we all struggle at times. Absolutely, and you know I, I've I do feel like I'm very lucky to have a group of male friends that um, you know we can be open and candid with each other. I I'm the first one to say that I am no means an expert at talking and being vulnerable and all that stuff. I still have a long way to go. I still find it very hard to, to do that or open up to people. Um, but I think if you're aware of it, you, you, you keep, you try. Um, awareness and, uh, is the thing, isn't it? It's being it's, aware. You can spend, uh, some people go through, through life not being aware of, of how they communicate with others, how, yeah. 
uh, or, or how they really feel about themselves, which is a tragedy. We need to come to, to understand and know ourselves so that we can stop making the same mistakes and we can be happier in our own skins. Yeah, I would say being, I, I'm very self-aware and I think it's a bit of a blessing and a curse at the same time because I tend to overthink all the time about things that I don't need to overthink about. And, you know, I think you, you just have to find that balance of um, what is in my control, what can I deal with now? Am I equipped to deal with it now? So, you know, these are all things that, and, and, and men are, I'm talking as, you know, as a male, I find that we are often put into a box of what we think masculinity, masculinity. is. What masculinity is. We, this is what we think masculinity is. And, you know, I think I would say that vulnerability is not a sign of weakness vulnerability is a sign of strength so Absolutely. i think i think that the more i think we, that, yeah, yeah. That it's it's okay to be vulnerable it's important to be able to be vulnerable i mean a lot of people run into problems because they can't be vulnerable they can't show it to another human being so yeah. so you run the other way and you remain closed off you know like your two characters in, in Tiny Pretty Things dancing around each other and not actually being honest. Yeah, and, and I think... And posturing and um, yeah. putting on an act. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think every single human being on this earth has probably had something good slap them in the face and then they've run away from it. And um, I think that's the case with those, with those characters, for sure. And my character, especially, you know, he's got somebody that wants to um, be that person for him and, and, and love him. And he's running away from it. And, you know, that's a very common, common thing that we see in life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The moment somebody offers you their love, you run the other way. It, it yeah. It causes so much heartache. I know. Yeah. For sure. And it's also a great topic to explore on screen. Um, yeah. It's a, a, a topic we never tire of, of watching or being completely fascinated by. I was Absolutely. very interested you were talking about the importance of breathing. <clears throat> I um, have interviewed some really eminent doctors and functional, functional consultants, functional mind body medicine is becoming a big thing uh, at last you know again we need to understand how our bodies work and mm. uh, a, top, uh, a doctor that I greatly admire has talked about the importance of breathing you know for your not just for your mental well-being but for your physical well-being we don't you know obviously where you and I are breathing now but are we breathing properly you know when you're stressed you you breathe shallowly yeah breathing is shallow and one yeah. of the one of the things that you learn if you practice yoga, and I think you do yoga, don't you? Um, I do, yeah. Well, I, I uh, haven't done it recently, but I, breathing, yeah. The breathing yeah. into a diaphragm. Yeah. Oxidate. And um, it, it has an amazing calming effect, but it, it's also energizing. Do you do you do a lot of breathing to, to energize and calm and to fine tune your, your mind and body? I, I would say as an actor, breathing, we learn a lot of breathing techniques and breathing, learning about the breath is essential. If you, um, it's just essential as an essential tool for, for actors. Yeah. And I definitely find myself breathing shallowly a lot. And if you're, what, ner if you're nervous or or well, yeah, exactly so what i try to do is to be conscious of it because you know physiologically you know when we are breathing very shallow that kind of sends our body into stress mode because i don't know traditionally maybe b before we evolved we were um running from predators or something 
thing. Yeah, running and is a woolly mammoth. <laughs> he's, exactly. So if you're Very breathing, uh, I think just physiologically, that's sending signals to your brain that something's wrong. But, you know, I think studies have been, have, have shown that when you breathe into your diaphragm and you breathe deeply, they release chemicals to the brain of relaxation and it, it's, it, it's it's absolutely wonderful isn't it, it is. <clears throat> you're a session of, of deep breathing followed by meditation you feel amazing you do, yeah. and you, feel it also gives you great focus and clarity and a sense of calm yeah exactly and i myself i have a busy mind and i, I always have stuff happening on my phone and i find it very hard to just center myself and and sit down and and concentrate so breathing helps me tap into that and relax and de-stress so it's it's very essential and i i still need to get better at you know all that meditation stuff and being conscious of it and meditation is just wonderful i i think you know if you can get to a stage where you try and do some every day it just it improves everything you want to do in life and it improves our relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. do, Absolutely. Do you, do, you, um, do you like to get out into nature? How, how else do you relax, Josh? Do you go hiking? What, what's, your, love... what's your idea of, of switching off and tuning out, you know, from technology, from your phone? What do you do? I love just going to the beach and um, swimming way out the back of the waves and by myself. What does just, what do you mean by at the back of the waves? What? Well, away from the people. Oh, away from the people, right. So I where would go deep. Not, I would go deep where it's not crowded, or finding a a, a a a smaller, less crowded beach, and just swimming and relaxing. And Aussie and, is hot then. I, definitely. Um, <laughs> that was the hardest part about living overseas. Was I missed the ocean so badly. So it's been nice to have the access to that. Do you and surf? Do you surf? I don't. No, no, I don't. Um, I never learned to surf. You've busted. <laughs> I've busted that cliche for sure. <laughs> I. And what else do I do to to de stress? Um, do you like yeah. cooking? What What else are you into? What else are you? What else are you passionate about? I love reading. Reading. And, so what um, have you, What have you been reading? What I'm, I've set a goal for myself. I'm trying to read my age in books every year. So I'm trying to read 24 books this year. And, right. um, and I just finished Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. And I'm not sure if you've read about it or heard about it. Or oh, it's, it's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal book. And it's not an autobiography. It's more of a collection of stories. And it talks, he talks about, what green lights are are the little signs that the universe gives you you know a sign that says that means go it means act now if you're more in tune with the green lights as he says in the book if you're more in tune with them in your life i think you'll find decision making a lot easier and you'll find that your path is actually really it's set for you you just need to listen to the signs so that's been the book i've been reading i think that's true that often we get these signals and sometimes we just ignore them, don't we? Human beings are very good at sabotaging themselves. Oh, 100%. And that I've, I think I've uh, um, followed those signs my entire career as an actor, um, which has led me to, you know, getting this role and um, having some success um, right now. So definitely if you're more in tune with what the universe is, is telling you then you will find things uh, come a lot easier what about australian film and drama have you watched a lot of of films that have come out of australia past and present you yeah want to I... work uh, in your home country and who who are your acting heroes Australian or otherwise. Heath Ledger is probably one of I my. You're going to bring up Heath Ledger. I just had a feeling. 
one of my acting heroes for sure I, because he's such a risk taker and i admire that as an artist he really just takes bold risks and makes bold decisions and that's so inspirational for a young actor especially because you know he was quite young when he was making these bold risks and so that, um, that inspires you totally. inspires you to, to to take risks too yeah totally because i i see somebody else taking risks and you know and it hey, works exactly and so it gives me the confidence to try more things so I would say he's probably my biggest um, Australian acting hero. And have you ever seen his um, indie film Candy? No, I've heard about it, but I haven't seen it. Is that it's that the film I should definitely watch? I think you should. I think you'd really, in, really get into it. It's um, he plays a heroin addict, and it's it's basically a love story um, between two um, addicts and yeah it just you just um it's really quite confronting and how you know and the the realness of that I entire I been, um, i mean the yeah. character that that he's ledger plays in candy is he someone who's adrift in yeah in the world? Definitely. Um, he's adrift in the world and you know it's it's re it really shows what people will do for that next hit and you know it becomes their entire purpose of existence and I think that's what the film does really well and it does it um it's quite confronting at times which you know I think for but any film roles that you're drawn to to Josh do you want to play these confronting characters these characters that, that perhaps are quite troubled are you drawn to those sort of characters or you do I definitely you am drawn. the rawness and authenticity of of human existence yeah i definitely am drawn to that kind of um uh, those kind of characters for sure uh, i think, think they would be so interesting to ex to discover and you know like i was saying that uh, that's the beauty of of acting is the opportunity to live in somebody else's shoes and that would be um such an interesting experience to to learn about for sure i want to ask you something because as an actor you're always having to get into someone else's shoes as you just said is there a danger that you land up not knowing who you are because you're this walter mitty character who has to constantly inhabit other people or again, does that come back to the meditation and the grounding? So, because I think some, certainly some great actors have, have gone to such extremes to play yeah. that they go home with the character, which causes problems. And yeah, I, I have def I've heard of actors that do that. And yeah. I don't think that's something that is, that I want can to do. Stop, can you switch off when once you- Yeah, have, I can, I can switch off. off the lights go off and you're not um, playing that role, you can switch back to being you? Yeah, I think I can. It definitely doesn't happen like a light switch. It happens maybe over a couple of hours and maybe once you unwind and, and yeah. you go back right. home and you have, you know, you have a shower or whatever and you get into bed or so you, you start to become yourself again. But, you know, if you do, if you do a, in an emotional scene, I've found myself very emotional or emotionally drained for hours after doing that scene. And it's hard to get out of when you've been, you know, crying or yelling or, you know, um, any of those. Oh, if it's, yeah, if, it, if it's um, a scene that requires a great deal of emotion, then it must be very draining and exhausting intellectually. To really exhausting. It's really mentally, mentally exhausting and mentally challenging. But at the same time, sometimes it's cathartic in a way. Um, have you have you watched any um, any of the great actors from past eras? Are you interested in that? Like Richard Burton, for example, or you know, I'm 
the, the, the great hell raisers like Richard Harris, I just find them completely extraordinary to watch. And, and I, I watched a classic movie that I'd never heard of uh, over Christmas called The Love Affair. You should mm. definitely check it out. The acting is in, extraordinary. It was a huge hit. It came out in 1939 on the eve of the Second World War. Oh, it's called cool. Love Affair and it stars two amazing Hollywood actors, um, Sh Charles Boyer, who was an intellectual actor who studied at the Sorbonne in Paris and Irene, Irene Dunn. And um, they fall in love when they're committed to other people on an ocean liner going back to mm. America. And Charles Boyer's character is a very talented artist, but he's adrift and he's a playboy and he's never had a proper job because he just um, courts rich women because he's handsome and fascinating. But he meets yeah. a singer and they fall in love and they, they make a commitment. It's a very famous film to meet in six months when he's got a job and, and he, he can be worthy of her and things don't go according to plan. They agree to meet at the top of the Empire State Building. It was remade twice, once with Cary Grant and it was remade with Annette, Annette Benning, but the acting is phenomenal in it. And it's also got this heightened sense of glamour, which I, I love. Mm. <clears throat> do you like, do you, um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen The Godfather and other films where the way a film looks and the way the characters look is very important. Yeah. I, it, I, does that appeal to you too, you know, where something is all about time and place? I'll, another example would be The Queen's Gambit, which I thought was extraordinary. Have you seen it? Oh, uh, yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Well, she's incredible. She she dominates every frame she's in. She's so fierce. And yeah. Her personality consumes you. But also what is so well done is the, the 60s period sets are so compelling. Mm -hmm. so authentic that you feel you are in the 60s and that you know that sets it in that particular time and the music as well are you interested in period pieces oh absolutely it's one of my dreams to do period pieces my one of my favorite shows is Peaky Blinders and one okay. of my favorite actors is Killian Murphy oh yeah uh, he has I, a, I love a Killian Murphy yeah, and I, I love that show. So that would be something I'd, I'd 100%. What about, Jane, what about Jane Austen, which has a, this extraordinary appeal? I mean, obviously, predominantly for women. Um, mm. you know, thinking of Bridgerton, which you haven't seen yet, but there, there's, another, um, there's another hit period drama that, that was Jane Austen's final novel, Sanditon. And obviously, there have been various incarnations of Pride and Prejudice. And we love them as you know that they are so popular yeah 50 years after this novelist died she has this extraordinary power over, yeah. over our culture and our hopeless romanticism yeah and i think that's love you know people want to believe in love and i think um that kind of hopeless romanticism has been around in humans for centuries and well, forever it just shows that we are ultimately um profoundly moved by by the opportunity to love another human being for that to be a possibility yeah yeah i i 100 agree with that i think that will obviously be around for, forever too so to so think what that would, what would be your what would be your dream role as a final question before we, the end, a fascinating interview. I never really have thought about this as my dream role, to be quite honest with you. I, I just, I know a role that I'd love to play when I see it. And you know, you know fairly quickly that you want to do it. Yeah. And I, I would say that something along the lines of in a period drama such as Peaky Blinders or even doing something in DC or Marvel um, universe would be an extraordinary experience that um, I'd love to. Being a superhero. 
Yeah, that'd be well, or a villain. I, <laughs> I think you said you'd you'd quite like to play Batman. Yeah, I I, no, I would. I, I think the Batman films are masterpieces. They are, and Nolan is but again. They're, they're a microcosm of society, aren't they? The, you know, the, mm -hmm. the push and pull between good and evil. Yeah. And and it's an extraordinary vehicle for for a lead for a lead character to to be imbued with these heroic qualities and of course again because life isn't perfect we always want the superhero to to turn up and save the day yeah and they're, they're as popular as you know as romantic heroes like mr darcy you know we're yeah. really fascinated with with them yeah that, I, and out of fashion and i i think i think we love to see we, we love to see you know, a hero's overcoming adversity. And I think that's at, at the crux of, you know, each of those films, especially the Batman um, in those films, you see him overcome so many dark. Yeah, so many obstacles. So many obstacles and so, so many, many baddies in, in all sorts of wickedly delicious incarnations. I mean, the, the costumes and, and the, you know, I'm thinking back to people like Jack Nicholson, who played the Joker. Mm. Um, the the it is a is a, it's a, again it's a great vehicle for ensemble acting. Again, it's timeless because we see it every day in in humanity. I mean, we're seeing a lot of it in oh, right um, now. Um, finally, do you do you have a sort of um, motto by which you you live by as a as a human being and as an actor given everything you've said um you know as a as a a person who is striving to do the best work they can and deal with you know your insecurities and your human frailties what gets yeah. you out of what gets you out of bed josh um what gets me out of bed every day is each day is a new opportunity to be better than the previous day. And obviously some days when you get out of bed, the day is going to be 10 times worse than the previous day, but you're still going to have another opportunity ten tomorrow. Or 10 times better. Or 10 times better. Are exactly. You, are, you an op are you ultimately an optimist rather than a pessimist? Yes. 100%. I am. That's important. Such, I'm such an optimist, borderline delusional at some at, at some stages. Um, you know, I feel like I was a little bit delusional in a way to even pursue this career to begin with. So, a lot of optimism involved in in well, my life. Bravery, I would say. I think it was very brave to to suddenly um, change course. And I, you know, I've met other people, not just actors, because I've interviewed people in different walks of life, you know, from David Attenborough to wow. <clears throat> someone like Kira Knightley or Clive Owen. You know, it's it's something that compels you forward, mm. right? Yeah, I, I feel like... It gives you, you know, the, the bravery or the balls to, to say, no, I don't want to do this, I want to do that, and mm. to go for it. Yeah. What anyone else thinks. Yeah, it, exactly. I feel like I am compelled by some sort of invisible force that's telling me to keep going, keep keep doing this. So for sure. Well, I can't wait to you know to see your your next film. You don't have a release date yet. No, I, we don't have a release date yet. No. Um, uh, what are you? What are you? Are you going to go to the beach? make me jealous is it is it warm in australia it's it's raining here and it's winter and it's gray it's not it's, too um, at the moment but it's very gray it's been like over 30 degrees every day and we've had a few storm we've had a few storms actually we've had a cyclone up north and we've had a bit of rain but uh, I think it's it's been overwhelmingly warm lately, so I try well, to get to the beach. I guess There's you're not. probably not missing the the sort of typical Canadian winter if you were based in 
Thank you. No, I'm definitely not missing that. It was um, it was a shock to the system when uh, I walked outside in, you know, Toronto, and it was like minus fifteen, which is not even close to how cold to to the coldest temperatures it gets. But for me, you know, I I never saw snow until a couple of years ago. So yeah, that was a big shock. I'm definitely not not missing the the chilly winters and losing my tan as well at the same time <laughs> but i guess you're hoping that you'll be able to head head back to canada is that your plan when things are uh, I, I yeah hopefully hopefully either canada or or the us um depending on wherever the work work takes me yeah well how how exciting i can't wait to see what you do do next josh 